morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for joining me. If you're still coming in, please come in, take seats, plenty available. Um, very nice to see you all here today. I'm Rajesh Merchandani, the Vice President for Communications and Policy Outreach at the Center for Global Development. And it's, uh, I welcome you all to the center uh, this morning. Uh, to those of you who join us in person and also to those of you who are watching on the live stream via CG Dev or also on our YouTube channel, welcome. Uh, I'm gonna give you details of how you can join the conversation shortly. And also we'll be uh, live tweeting the event uh, and we encourage all of you here to tweet as well following using the hashtag CGD talks. Uh, and then we'll be taking questions via that uh, mode as well. I'll give you some, uh, uh, some instructions on that in a second. But let me just explain a little bit about why we're here. I mean, many of you have been to one of these events before, but the Latin America Committee on Macroeconomic and Financial Issues is made up, as many of you know, of eminent members of the policymaking and research communities with experience and expertise in Latin American macroeconomic issues. The committee meets twice a year and considers a question important to the region. This time around, the question on everyone's lips is what does this growing call and the growing implementation of more protectionist policies around the world mean for Latin America? The rise of President Trump, the vote for Brexit, the move in other major economies towards less integration reflects in those countries at least discontent amongst the middle classes, yet globalization in emerging markets has led to higher living standards for people. Those two seem to be at odds. Uh, as Liliana Rojas Suarez, our senior fellow, the chair of the committee, will explain shortly, the current economic environment for Latin America and countries isn't great anyway. <laughs> and now these external factors will come into play as well. So what could be the re repercussions? And what are the policy options for Latin American economies? Should they retaliate? Should they buck the trend and integrate more? These are the kind of things we're gonna be discussing and hearing about uh, shortly. After Liliana's presentation, I'm gonna invite the other panelists up to the stage and then I'll introduce everybody. And then we'll kick off with a question each to our panelists. Uh, and we may also call on other members of the committee who are sitting in the audience uh, to give us their views uh, as well. So if you're watching on the live stream or on the YouTube channel, there's a comment section at the bottom of the page. Uh, we invite you to please leave us a question, which we'll try and ask during the audience question and answer session. Uh, if you do do that, please tell us who you are uh, as well and what your affiliation is. And you can also send us a question via Twitter, at uh, CGDev is our handle, and again, that hashtag is CGD Talks. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Liliana Rojas Suarez to take up the stage and take us through this latest statement. continuing the support to the committee. Uh, Rajesh is going to introduce uh, the members that are here from the committee. But I just want uh, recognizing that two members that were with us until yesterday evening, Pablo Guidotti, a uh, professor from Torquato di Tela, and Enrique Mendoza, a uh, professor from, Penn, uh, uh, from UPenn, uh, were also with us and uh, had to leave because they're teaching uh, this morning. So in this statement, we basically ask, the quest, ask two questions. First, what are the effects of the protectionist threat coming from advanced economies, especially the US um, on Latin America? And what can Latin America do about it? To answer the first question, we first notice, which is the starting point. And the starting point is a region that has already been hit by very adverse shocks, especially on the declining um, uh, trade flows, the deteriorated terms of trade, and the decline in foreign direct investment. And also in that context, you have that the domestic macroeconomic outlook in the region remains weak or uncertain in many countries. Countries that used to be very dynamic, like Chile, Mexico, and Colombia are growing at very low rates. Countries are taking that aware in recession, like Argentina and uh, um, Brazil, where are taking a long time to get out of that recession. And some other countries, like Ecuador and Venezuela, are getting deeper into recession. And in many of these countries, uh, the debt ratios, uh, the government debt ratios, and the fiscal accounts are deteriorating. So it's in this context that the, protector, the protectionist threat coming from the US complicate further the external environment and compounds the existing, with existing weaknesses in Latin America. Thus, the protectionist threat basically happens as a double whammy 
hitting the already fragile Latin American economies. So while some, some of the US protectionist threats have started to materialize, like the exit of the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this well-known TPP, uh, some of the other threats are there um, and have not yet materialized, right? So we consider four, and I will just basically name them, will not expand on that as questions will um, go into details. The first one is the adoption of the so-called border adjustment uh, tax. For those of you who have tried to understand it, good luck. <laughs> uh, it keeps changing, and I'm not, we are not going to get into detail. We spend almost a day discussing about the, the tax. But basically, it can be summarized as import taxes and export tax credits to foreign corporations operating in the United States. And the committee believes that that is going to hurt Latin American exports. There are some experts in the United States that claim that the tax is going to be neutral, but for reasons that are explained in the paper, in the, in the document that I hope all of you have, <coughs> uh, we don't believe that's going to be the case. There are no uh, empirical experience, and uh, the explanation of uh, determination of exchange rate is very limited in the, in the proposal for this uh, tax. So we think that this, th this kind of tax, in the worst case scenario, could actually may lead to a generalized trade war. Uh, risking a sharp reduction in capital flows that would compound the adverse effect of the reduction in trade flows. A piece of good news here is that we think that the implementation of the VAT is going to encounter a lot of opposition from the United States. As you all know, trade is not what it used to be. Now the modern structure of trade is more organized through global value change, and this makes the VAT incidence uh, to most likely be uneven across firms and therefore disrupt, um, uh, very disruptive for the behavior of the US international firms, like Walmart, for example. So we don't think that it's going to progress, but if it progress, the risks are, the stakes are really high. Second uh, is the revision of trade agreements, especially NAFTA. And on this, we know that the most severe consequences could be for Mexico, given its high dependence um, on uh, trade capital flows, foreign direct investment from the United States. Uh, related to that threat is threat number three, which is that the um, official pressures coming from the US that are applied to US-based uh, companies to redirect investment into the United States and away from other countries, especially Mexico. So those two threats are related. And finally, a significant trade restrictions to China. That is an indirect effect that by exacerbating China um, a slowdown in economic growth uh, would hurt uh, the countries in Latin America, basically exports from Latin America and therefore growth. We already had an experience about this, and it's the 2013-2014 um, experience where lower commodity prices also adverse capital inflows to Latin America, especially in oil and mining. So a threat that affects China would have impact on trade and capital inflows to Latin America. So under this scenario, what can Latin America do? Well, in spite about the uncertainty uh, about how much uh, protectionism is actually going to materialize, there is something that the committee agrees. Latin America cannot be sitting pretty, waiting to see what the US is going to do. So cannot run the risk to be unprepared for these adverse uh, effects on exports, capital flows, and growth. So in the committee's view, the region response should be Two things, basically. Avoid generalism. Avoid self-defeating actions and seize opportunities proactively. Okay, That should be kind of the guidance for the reaction from Latin America. Choose 
self-defeating actions that the committee identified clearly, and there could be more, but let's, let me uh, present two. First is avoid retaliation in the face of protectionism. Latin America needs trade to grow sustainable. Latin America cannot do it without trade. Barriers to trade have already been tried in Latin America and have been a mistake uh, in the past. And that mistake, history shows, should not be repeated. However, this doesn't mean that the Latin America should not start getting ready to collectively contract with other countries in the region as well as with countries from other regions to in the eventual protectionists of the US, be ready to uh, raise these difficulties and protest uh, within the WTO, another multilateral organization. So there is a job of preparing that needs to be done. The second self-defeating action also reflects another mistake of the past, and is implemented policies that may perpetuate inefficiencies and low productivities in domestic companies. For example, if there is a reduction in the corporate income tax in advanced economies, specifically in the, uh, in the US, that may elicit calls uh, from uh, corporations in Latin America to do the same. Uh, but either that, or what about if you government compensate me through other kind of uh, some type of subsidies or other financial uh, fiscal stimulu stimulus, especially using the financial sector? Well, we have again learned from the, the past that these policies might compromise fiscal sustainability and generate misallocation of resources. So again, avoiding the mistake of the past is the first set of recommendations. And the second is policies to seize opportunities, okay? And here we recognize three, again, among the many that can be. The first one is, or the first two are trade related. You see, given the current environment, there is an opportunity for strengthening Latin American economic ties with Europe and Asia. In the, the, in the past, Europe, there are some, some agreements, some trade agreements between some Latin American countries and Europe. But there are many that are not there, but the Europeans under the threat would be much more willing now to make deals with Latin America. And so this is an opportunity that needs to be uh, taken. Actually, Mexico has already started modernizing its trade agreement with the European Union. Um, and the committee recommends that, of course, for Mexico, it's kind of obvious because the threat is the largest. But the committee recommends that that should be the lead example that the rest of the region should follow. Making sure, especially, that the European Union becomes more open to agricultural products from the region because that's the problem that has happened in the past, right? I mean, so this is an opportunity, right? I mean, we need more trade, everybody needs so, so let's negotiate smartly. So similar actions should be taken with Asia, especially in the context that China now has advocated to be the champion of globalization vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, United States protectionist threat. Now, this is potentially an opportunity uh, for Latin America provided, again, that China is more open and more willing in the past to open its domestic markets. Uh, it's not easy to um, export products to China. And uh, um, somebody, some others can expand of that. The second um, uh, recommendation on the trade side is the strengthening regional uh, economic integration through open regionalism. Again, avoiding the mistakes of the past. In the past, um, regionalism, kind of regional trade, uh, and financial integration implied basically a substitute for globalization. We don't see that at all. We see that as a complement to globalization. And there are examples that are moving in that direction, like the Pacific Alliance, and the CAFTA Dominican Republic um, agreements with the United States and Europe. And for that, the first step, of course, needs to be harmonization of uh, regulation and policies between countries to avoid arbitrage, and to, uh, especially in the financial sector. 
Uh, we don't want to expand on that, but there was a big discussion during the committee about how come there are so many Colombian banks, not so many, the largest Colombian banks, um, uh, setting uh, businesses, bank uh, businesses in the Central America. And one of the questions is, well, do we have the same kind of uh, regulations, banking regulations in both settings, or there are incentive for regulatory arbitrage that have induced the move of those companies into Central America? That is risky for both, and there are many open questions as to where if the bank were going to fail, who's the lender of that resort, who's going to make, okay. So in dealing with those issues are a priority for the region. Um, and finally, um, as uh, we stated before, the potential scenario of a threat war um, originated by the rise in the US, uh, United States uh, protectionism may result in uh, eventual reversal of capital inflows to Latin America. So from the macroeconomic point of view, uh, what to do? So in our view, facing this threat, policymakers should be especially be vigilant to the presence of large but transitory incentive for carry trade in the region. You have noticed that the uh, Fed increased interest rates and capital inflows to the region have increased. Usually you expect the opposite, right? But no, the reason is that, first of all, there are two, two components. First, the spread it, between interest rates in Latin America and the United States remains, remains extremely large. It's, the interest rates in advanced economies are really, really low. And so there is a lot of space. And second, um, the, the market and the Fed announcement basically leads you to believe that the increase in interest rates in the United States are going to be gradual, you know, slowly, little by little, and so it's like there would be a lot of time before that spread actually closed. But that also is giving you all the signs or the signals that the inflows are basically playing the carry trade, and so they have a temporary characteristic, a transitory characteristic, as opposed to being long-term flow. In that context, we are concerned about the instabilities, financial instabilities that this could create, including the, uh, an excessive um, uh, rate of uh, credit. And so we recommend the implementation um, of, uh, or the intensification of uh, uh, macroprudential policies, um, including countercyclical uh, reserve requirements, as um, well as taxes on short-term foreign um, uh, loosening by banks. With respect to monetary policy, we also have um, a significant discussion on this. And the, the committee uh, basically believes that uh, in, in an environment where the stakes are very high, monetary policy is not going to be the tool that is going to solve the problem of less growth and uh, uh, reactivation of the economy. But it, ha it has to, uh, it can play a role um, uh, for lowering interest rates uh, in those countries where not only inflation is low, but it will not compromise their credibility if they do so. So in those cases, policy rates could be reduced precisely to weaken incentives for carry trade. So to sum up, and um, as basically the content of the, of the um, uh, statement, uh, we have dealt in depth with the dis a discussion about the threats coming from the US. We think that some are more likely and some others are much more difficult. Some of the discussion that will follow will expand on that. But the bottom line, our most important uh, 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 result from the discussion is that Latin America cannot remain active, have to be ready to go to the WTO, have to take those hanging fruits that are in, in the, uh, right now uh, arising because of the threats, which are especially in the trade area, uh, especially in negotiations with the European Union and, uh, and Asia. And most importantly, do not make the mistake of the past. Not because the rest of the world, especially the advanced economy, which used to be the lead, leader of free trade, is backing up. That, it, that doesn't mean that Latin America should also follow that example. Thank you.
Thanks, Liliana. So Liliana's going to take her seat on the stage. And other panelists, I'm going to invite you to come up onto the stage as well as I introduce you. So Liliana Rahaswaris, you have all met, obviously. Just uh, coming up here now, this is Guillermo Perry. Uh, he's an on-resident fellow here at CGD uh, and also the former chief economist of the Latin American Caribbean region for the World Bank. Uh, Laura Alfaro is the Warren Albert Professor at Harvard Business School and the former Minister of National Planning and Economic Policy in Costa Rica. Uh, Guillermo Calvo, next to Laura, uh, is Professor of Economics at the International and Public Affairs at Columbia University and the former Chief Economist at the Inter-American Development Bank. And then uh, next to Liliana is Augusto de la Torre, who is the former Chief Economist for Latin America and the Caribbean at the World Bank and the former governor of the Central Bank of Ecuador. So quite a lot of credentials amongst you, panel. Hi, and I may uh, add something. Welcome, Augusto, the new addition to the committee. Oh, <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, and also, might want to ask you a couple of questions about Ecuador later as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me also uh, recognize, sitting on the front row, two other members of the committee who, as you can see, we couldn't fit onto the stage, but we would love to have had them on the stage just uh, this morning. Uh, Alberto Carrasquilla, who's a, a senior partner in Configura Capital and former Minister of Finance and Public Credit in Colombia, and Roque Fernandez, the director of the Fund for the Promotion of Research at Sema University, and the former Minister of Finance for Argentina, right on the front row here. Welcome to all of you. Uh, my goodness, such expertise here. Where do we begin? Um, Guillermo Perry, let's start with you. Um, Liliana talked about NAFTA as one of the big threats here. Uh, if there's an unraveling of NAFTA, if the US wants to do this. But uh, other countries are involved here. So could you just explain to people what are the difficulties, what are the challenges involved in trying to unpick NAFTA? Well, in purely technical terms, one would think that the US is not going to do too much against NAFTA. Because, as Liliana mentioned, the world, the world trade today is based on value chains. And this is especially true for the trade between the US and Mexico. Uh, there is a study from the Congressional Research Service that showed that nearly 40% of imports from Mexico actually are US originated inputs. The corresponding figure for Canada is 25%, for China is 5%. So if there is a trade area in which trying to tamper with tariffs would really shoot the US in its foot is in the trade with Mexico. There are several companies, several uh, sectors like the automotive uh, industry, electronics, appliance, and machinery that rely heavily on this co-production with Mexico for being more efficient and competitive. Actually, the automotive industry in the US survived against the Japanese threat of, of two decades ago because of, of that co-production. Now, but that's the technical argument. Two things may happen then. One, that in spite of that, the administration decides to go ahead with the general tariffs to Mexico, thinking that even if there are costs in the long term, there may be some gains in the short term. Because in the past, protection, protection with the normal trade in the past delivered short-term effects. The protected industries grew more. But in this kind of trade, this is not a foregone conclusion. The disruption could be so high in the beginning that there may be very high cost long-term and not benefits in the short-term. So another possibility is that the US begins to do uh, cherry picking. We put a uh, tariff to this, imp to this import, not to this one, to this input, not to this one. And actually, there is a government in, in Latin America that was specialist in that, which was the Argentine government during the Kirchner's. And they did a lot of this and became world uh, class experts. The results in Argentina were terrible. But some of these people are unemployed and they may be advised <laughs> the US Trade Administration of how, how to manage this. To, to finalize, these kind of problems are not only with NAFTA. They, these problems would also be there with the border adjustment tax. 
because a border, a general border adjustment tax will, will hurt all the trade based on value global change that the US has with many countries in the world. So it will also be shooting uh, the US in the feet, not as much as will happen with Mexico in particular. And, and finally, you know, because of all of this, one can expect that a lot of US interests, very powerful interests, are going to oppose these moves, as it's happening now. Uh, in spite, uh, all of this doesn't guarantee that nothing is done. The president has very broad legal powers in the US to take the US out of international treaties, to impose tariffs temporary or permanent for different reasons, much more than in other countries. So we cannot dismiss the possibility that in spite of these bad effects for the US, things are done and we have to prepare ourselves, as Liliana said. Okay, Guillermo, thanks very much. Did you say at the beginning there that 40% of uh, inputs into Mexican goods came from America? 40% of what the US inputs from Mexico, 40% uh -huh. of, the, of the value added, are inputs that were produced in the US. Right. Right. So, so putting a, a tariff on, 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 on Mexican imports is like putting a tax on U.S. exports to, of, of intermediate products to Mexico. So uh, uh, Augusto de la Torre, picking up on this point of this symbiotic relationship between America and Mexico, um, you know, Mexico has kind of relied on the U.S. as a kind of motor of growth. Uh, and how much do you think of Mexico's current difficulties then are kind of US made compared to Mexico made? What are the kind of your thoughts on that? Well, we're just, uh, can you guys see me? It's on, yeah. So, okay. so I think we're just at the beginning of the effects of the possible change in protectionist attitudes vis-a-vis uh, -vis Mexico in the United States. So it's hard to assess so far how much damage this will, this will end up doing to the, to the Mexican economy. But what, when one assesses whether uh, uh, how much of the problems in Mexico are homegrown and how much come from outside, it's always wise to, to say we, don't know it, we do not know exactly and there's a little bit of everything. There's no question that there are some problems in Mexico that are homegrown. Think, for instance, of the information that Liliana reported that the debt in Mexico has grown very rapidly over the last eight years from 30% of GDP to 48% of GDP that suggests that the fiscal problems were brewing in Mexico for some time, and even before the oil prices began to decline. So there were issues in the, in the Mexican fiscal process that had been there for a while. In addition, Mexico has had significant internal problems associated with institutions and corruption and violence, which are obviously have a connection to international uh, reasons, but they are mainly developed inside of Mexico. And uh, finally, I think most, most recently, Mexico has been experiencing a significant pickup in inflation, much of which cannot be fully attributed to the recent changes in the US policies. So there is an element of homegrown. On the other hand, one can see that there are international factors and bad luck that have complicated the situation. I think the most important event of bad luck was, in my opinion, that unfortunate timing to a very important energy reform in Mexico, which if the international conditions would have not changed so dramatically in the price of oil, et cetera, one could have guessed that that reform would have given more growth dividends to Mexico, and those were uh, dampened by the international conditions. That said, one should not underestimate the effects of U.S. trade policies and, protect and the possible rise of protection in the U.S., on the Mexican economy. We're already seeing a tremendous amount of volatility. It may be that expectations about the future are getting unhinged, which will complicate dramatically monetary policy uh, implementation. And already, one can see that that uncertainty is, in all likelihood, the uh, reorienting investment away from Mexico or stopping investment. So uh, that should not be underestimated. Okay, Augusto, thank you. Uh, we'll pick up on a couple of points uh, uh, later on in the discussion. Um, Laura, let me uh, uh, bring you in here. Um, Lina was talking about, the committee's talked about in the statement, um, this recommendation of greater open regionalism. Um, let's say, for example, Brazil wants to lead in this process, the biggest economy. Um, <coughs> what would it take 
for Brazil to be a leader uh, in that push towards greater open regionalism. So, um, as we know, Brazil um, traditionally has been less engaged in openness, if you want, than other countries in Latin America. And here, I think as the size has played a role, but also the development policies that Brazil has pursued after World War II. But right now, Brazil is hope, hopefully turning the page in what has been the worst recession uh, since the Great Depression. And within that context, fiscal sustainability has been a priority, also trying to engage in reforms that push for, for growth. Let's also keep in mind that the current administration is not a very popular administration. The transition came about through a complicated, if you want, political process. And so within that context, it's also not very legitimate. Despite that, they are pushing ahead on reforms. And I think if they manage to, to do a couple more, in particular the pension reform, they may set the stage for more sustainable growth. The reforms that they have done has allowed them to reduce interest rates, which would also help them. But in the current context, it's clear that um, a leadership role in, is not Brazil's uh, priority, and I would say capacity. I think they will do things that are consistent with more openness that the government has announced uh, with Mercosur to engage again with Europe and other countries. But again, it's probably not going to be their priority. And for Brazil to take a leadership role, I think in addition to some more stability and, and a space in the economic ground, I do think they need a, a different leadership. The, the current administration doesn't have that, if you want, that role. I think a former Fernando Enrique Cardoso had a good environment, but also he, he was just like, if you want, as, as we say, the type. Uh, so bar a new administration, I just don't see Brazil taking that, that leadership role. Interesting. Good for, uh, I'm scribbing down lots of good follow-up questions for you and shortly <laughs> on that. But let's bring in a couple of the other panelists. Uh, uh, Guillermo Calvo, um, you're an expert on understanding and predicting episodes of what we call sudden stops of capital inflows to emerging markets, as Liliana uh, suggested, might emerge. Um, given the current circumstances and some of the things that you all wrote in the statement, um, do you see those conditions in Latin America emerging in the future for this sudden stop? What are those conditions, and you know what, what should countries do to respond? I, I think it's worth uh, making the distinction between sudden stop, that typically has been a shock coming from the financial sector, and a terms of play shock uh, that we had recently. Now, the experiences and the results are very different. We uh, suffer a lot from uh, sudden stops, and the region seems to have been very resilient to a very large terms of trade shock. We should not uh, forget about that, because <coughs> the present uh, uh, situation is more like another terms of trade shock than, uh, than a sudden stop. Uh, so we've seen the region uh, very resilient. We've seen certainly uh, the, the effects of that especially in the case of uh, Brazil and uh, even uh, Colombia uh, and others. I mean, a slowdown in growth, certainly. There's no problem in explaining that. But uh, so if you suffer a shock like that, that this is expected. But when we talk about sudden stop, it's just uh, one big step in, uh, into, into crisis. Uh, 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 scenario. Uh, so that's where the question, I should put the question and be careful not to extrapolate any big shock, uh, interpret that as a, as a sudden stop. Now from that uh, perspective, I think the variables uh, that we've seen now in operation may not trigger a, a, a sudden stop. It may trigger an additional adjustment but if the capital market is open, basically open for emerging markets, then there is a smoothing out effect that uh, can be operating there in the background and sort of smooth out, soften the blow. The concern, and with this I, I, I will end, the concern is precisely that the shock may come from the financial sector through, for example, an increase in the Fed interest rates that go beyond what uh, uh, 
uh, people are expecting, the market is expecting at this point. Could that happen? Yes, we've seen that. The Fed is reacting to something. We don't know. There are lots of uncertainty. It's possible. We've seen it. And the, and the region is in a delicate situation uh, in the sense that, uh, for example, fiscal deficits are still large. Current account deficits are very large. So especially current account deficit is, uh, is, 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 is a place where typically sudden stop uh, have a big effect, force a very large contraction in aggregate demand, et cetera, et cetera, that we are familiar with. So the countries are open to that. I don't see the conditions at present, but it would be a big mistake to be complacent about it. Okay, thanks. Lilian, let's bring you back in here. Um, I'm tempted to ask you to explain the border adjustment tax. No, <laughs> I refuse. <laughs> but let's get you to talk about China, because you talked about that in the statement. Um, and it's not just, it's, it's the knock-on effect of the US imposing restrictions against China and the effect of that on Latin American economies, uh, which you talked about. But let's think about economic developments within China. Uh, what, could, what could happen on that front that might actually force the US's hand? Right. Uh, China, and we have said this in a number of previous statements, is facing its own uh, problems in terms of financial fragilities. And the authorities are actually taking actions to try to control them. For example, there are currently controls on shadow banking and, uh, and the practice to decrease the vulnerabilities uh, to a crisis. But at the same time, the Chinese authorities are promoting expansion of credit. So on the one hand, uh, shadow banking is trying to be uh, tampered, but overall credit growth is trying to be incentivized because they don't want to lose the uh, growth uh, um, uh, promises that they have made to the, to the world. Also, as you know, there is um, uh, appreciation in the, um, uh, or over appreciation in the housing market is estimated to be between 20 to 30%. And uh, there has been recently introduced some uh, property purchase restrictions in the large uh, uh, cities. The fact is that right now, China is exper experiencing capital outflows. And they have imposed controls. They are working so far, but we have no idea for how much longer. So if capital outflows were going to be larger than they are now, and a correction is needed in terms of exchange rate depreciation, a good correction, right, needed to uh, take into account this problem. So that exchange rate depreciation could be misunderstood by the US administration as a currency manipulation. Let's look at the Chinese again depreciating their currency to growth, when in reality that would be the appropriate solution to vulnerabilities that would be happening in China. So our concern as a committee is that those kind of things could be uh, because of the misinterpretation of certain variables that especially the exchange rate, the protectionist threat would come and say, okay, let's stop currency manipulation in China. And that would be terrible because that would be counteracting a good policy that would actually hurt even more uh, uh, China prospects and therefore back to Latin America. Okay, fine. Thanks, panelists. Um, for the next one, I'm going to ask some follow-up questions and I want you just to just jump in when you want to kind of contribute, don't wait to uh, be asked. And I'm going to pick up directly on some of the things uh, that you talked about. Um, one thing, Guillermo Calvo, let me come to you for, uh, first of all on this. Um, I just want to get a sense from you of, the, of Argentina's experience of what one of the other panelists talked about, you know, uh, described as cherry picking trade tariffs. Um, what was the country's experience? What's the effect of that? Would, do you think America would suffer in the same way, experience in the same way? And if others want to jump in here as well, that will be excellent, particularly maybe Rocky Fernandez from Argentina as well. Uh, if you do want to, just let me know. We'll bring a microphone to you as well. Well, in, in one, in a nutshell, I wouldn't recommend anybody to do that. <laughs> uh, so maybe I could stop right there. Uh, they, uh, I mean, the, the, the uh, they, they, they did that, however, during a period, there was a boom period in the country. So several other things were working 
their way, but uh, really uh, that uh, uh, interfere seriously with uh, with trade. And I, once again, it was not uh, noticed by so much by the population because they did that uh, uh, at least for an extended period of time during the super cycle uh, period that uh, sort of covered the, the mistake. Later on, the mistake started to become obvious, and uh, certainly that uh, kind of model could not uh, be sustainable. Roque Fernandez, I'm going to bring you in. I'm just going to go over here and grab a microphone for you. Okay. So um, talk amongst yourselves for 30 seconds while I get back. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go. Okay. Is this on? Yes. Great. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Speak to our audience. Okay. <laughs> In the case of Argentina, uh, we don't have to wait too much to understand what uh, will happen with interpretation of the border adjustment tax, because there was a prior action by the US administration that was directly the prohibition of import from Argentina on Citrix. So uh, I, I don't have to read the, the, the proposal or, or the committee that is uh, uh, being elaborated in, in the near future. So uh, that was a very clear signal of that stuff. At the, at the beginning, I, I, I was somehow uh, curious uh, about the presentation because they emphasized it in the newspaper, in Argentinian newspaper, that there was a, a important modification in the corporation income tax. Okay, it was not presented like a commercial policy. It was presented in the way that, okay, we are going to introduce a, a very important modification that will have an impact in a reduction in the corporation income tax. Given that uh, we have in Argentina uh, some ideas of doing some sort of modification, we paid attention to, to that idea. But unfortunately, we don't, we don't know what is uh, really going to be, because uh, what we have in the newspaper is that imports, uh, according to, to, to the proposal that was in the newspaper, imports will not be deductible in the income tax statement. That is what I read, OK? Um, but in the, in the other hand, there's going to be a tax credit for export. Uh, and if you look at the... the um, tax pressure that you have in the US uh, that is based uh, in, in very heavily in income taxes. And if you look at what happened in Argentina, we don't have a, a such a heavy burden in the income taxes because we have value added taxes. So the, in, in the total amount of revenues are a different proportion. But anyway, I think that uh, according to what I believe that it's important for Argentina. We need investment. We need a lot of investment because we have been disinvesting in the last uh, 10 or, or 15 years. That would not be a bad idea to review what happened with the corporate income tax. So I don't know what is going to be, at the end, the impact of that fiscal modification. But it's, tot it's going to be totally different to look at the problem. Has a modification in the corporate income tax if, different from looking at the proposal has a commercial policy, okay? So I wish the proposal was oriented to the modification of the corporate income tax more than restriction to trade. Okay, thank you. Alberto, you look like you were getting ready to say something. Do you want to chime in there? No, okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, let me take that back off you. Thank you very much. Um, Laura, um, if not Brazil, then who? in terms of leading. You said Brazil didn't have the priority or the capacities. And who else in the region on this point of greater open regionalism? And I'd like to get some more views of the other panelists on this point too. That's a, that's a good question. Um, you should raise his salary. Um, <laughs> I concur. <laughs> <laughs> because there are, one would want um, a government that would be positioned with certain legitimacy to do that. And sadly, the ones that have more at play, which would be the more open economy related countries, and I'm thinking here uh, maybe a Mexico or even a Colombia, um, right now their leaders are not very legitimate, um, which may undermine a little bit 
their position mostly within the country, not necessarily abroad. I'm thinking the president of Mexico, again, not very popular in Mexico, but he would be the obvious choice right now uh, to take that role. Sadly, as I said, I, I think internally he's not very popular. Um, Central America, as much as I like my region, we're just very small. Um, and our, our president right now is not someone who has made his name on, on openness, so it becomes uh, difficult. I think Colombia also Santos, because of some political economy right now, he's also a little bit hurt. I don't see Argentina because of the situation inside the country to be able to take that role. And Chile is also going through bad times, um, relatively speaking, in terms of uh, low growth. So I, I think, sadly, uh, we're being hit with this shock in a moment that we also don't have a very obvious political leader. Um, Let's get yeah, to that. Uh, Dear Macalvo, then Dear Macari. Yeah, uh, no, I just wanted to add that I agree fully uh, with Laura, uh, and I wouldn't know what is the best arrangement in that, uh, in that respect. But there is something that maybe we want to keep in mind when we think of what is the best way to uh, organize the, the region to uh, fulfill the, the hopes of the committee and other people, of course. Uh, and uh, the thing is that uh, just going ahead and saying, look, uh, we want to form a coalition to open to trade or trade opening, uh, that may not be popular. I mean, uh, there are many people who are opposed to that, and they will say, oh, here they are, the, the usual neoliberals with the usual uh, recommendation. Uh, so we have to be careful with that, because uh, the, the wording uh, may, be, may be important, and maybe the, the, the leaders, that's why we need politicians for this more than economists, uh, the <coughs> leaders should perhaps convey the notion that uh, I don't know, maybe this is a reaction to kind of a, an offensive from the north, uh, and the region in a sort of Bolivarian way is getting together, and so on. That's why you need a leader, somebody who inspires, and if possible, do not emphasize too much the trade opening. Perhaps in addition, marketing. Right, <laughs> the, the marketing is... If I may, I, I don't think... None of us, and, and the, the committee doesn't say, a big idea of getting all of Latin America together in integration. We, we have had too much of that rhetoric in the past, and it hasn't gone anywhere. What we highlight are more down-to-earth uh, possibilities. For example, the Central American common market have been going in the direction of open regionalism, and this is an opportunity to strengthen that. The Pacific Alliance has been going in the same direction. This is an opportunity to strengthen, to actually, lately it has not, it began very strongly and lately it has not moved ahead very mm. fast. So this may be an opportunity for doing that in financial integration, in getting new members inside, for example, Costa Rica and others, in beginning to be more aggressive in their uh, relation with Asia, which was one of the main ideas behind the Pacific Alliance. And President Bachelet, for a long time, has been asking, suggesting to do something she called a convergence between Mercosur and Pacific Alliance. And initially, Brazil especially, but also Argentina, were not very interested in that at all. But the changes in the political direction in both countries and the fact that they have gone through a difficult period. And all these threats around the protectionists may create the environment for the beginning of talks. I mean, anything about the idea of convergence between Mercosur and Pacific Alliance is a very long shot. It's not going to happen in, 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 in a few years. But at least some serious discussions may, may begin. So the way we see it is more like this this kind of, of let's go in the right direction, those that are already going in the right direction, let's do it. Others, we should bring them to the table as much as, as they can, and there may be some possibilities there. Augusto. 
You know, a, a lot of going in the right direction also derives from lessons from the past. We have got a lot of rhetoric about uh, a lowering of tariffs and free trade, more rhetoric than actual action. And where you can take actual actions may not have the, may not generate the political antibodies that the gentleman was talking about. If you, for instance, concentrate on cleaning up existing arrangements in terms of rule, rules of origin, for instance, People see a lot of benefits by simply cleaning up this, what's called the spaghetti bowl by harmonizing rule of origins and allowing the accumulation of rule of origins across the members of the same, of the same uh, group. That's one. And there's so much to be had in terms of benefits to better market, uh, better functioning of markets. If you could do uh, things that facilitate transport logistics across frontiers, that is the border crossing, so you don't have to change truck when you go to a different country, and you can ease transports, or convergence in regulations that create an, an environment for investment where investors can choose to distribute investments across countries in Latin America because the regulatory environment is more or less even. So those type of areas may have greater dividends than the traditional rhetoric of ministries of external affairs about tariff reduction. So, that doesn't really get to the question of uh, yes. who's going to lead. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, nobody. Um, Different group. Liliana. Yeah, well, I have to agree with uh, everybody that is saying we really don't have a natural leader in the region. Uh, the region One of you needs to run. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should run, right? <laughs> uh, traditionally, uh, groups have actually been created and then destroyed uh, because not even a small partnership have been able to survive. There is not uh, in the region these, I, as uh, opposite to Europe, say, this common factor that uh, wants within the population a common region. is more, okay, we have problems coming uh, in our domestic economy, let's solve them. So the, not, the domestic priorities usually take first priority. And there, I think that that's why I would support more what Guillermo Perry was saying in terms of there are good uh, movements right now. I like the Pacific Alliance significantly because it's formed by medium-sized uh, countries and Mexico, I mean three plus one large Mexico, uh, which um, have been advancing very slowly but consistently and in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, Many countries have now are now trying to get in, and uh, therefore you can raise the bar because now you are building credibility, and so you're raising the bar uh, for uh, others to uh, uh, be incorporated, and a number of ob uh, observers, right? Just just uh, uh, countries that are watching how this particular uh, regional integration is happening. So to me, if I have to make a bet to your question, I would put my bet into the Pacific Alliance. Okay. Interesting. Let's talk now about one of the other things that the, the statement talks about, uh, which is urging countries to avoid retaliation, uh, retaliatory measures. Um, this is a group of economists telling politicians not to retaliate. Um, let's get some views on the, the, you know, how realistic that's going to be. Alberto. Want to bring in Alberto? Yeah, for sure. Can we get a microphone down <laughs> in the front? <laughs> Alberto Carasquia, the former Minister of Finance and Public Credit in Colombia. Alberto, welcome. And please turn and talk to the audience. I think the, the word uh, retaliation may, may seem a little bit strong. I think what the committee was discussing is not, uh, well, you do this to me, I do this to you. Is the microphone on? Uh, what one? Yeah. I think that, uh, sorry about that, the retaliation concept is not, uh, is, is very, very strong. Uh, it's not a matter of uh, uh, the usual retaliation discussion in, 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 in trade in the 1930s or something like that. The issue is, uh, is more uh, in line with, the, with the, the adoption of accommodating policies and the danger that accommodating policies may have. In other words, uh, Let's say that there is a big tax reform that uh, favors uh, U.S. Uh, corporations and uh, industrial groups in, in Latin America believe that they, they would be affected by, by this change and there would be proposals to use the financial, this was mentioned by Liliana, to use the financial sector 
to compensate, not to retaliate, but rather to compensate. And I think that uh, that would be, uh, that, that would put us in a very uh, a slippery slope, so, so to speak. Uh, secondly, the, the retaliation concept was discussed in, in, in the following situation. We have a world which uh, still has a lot of liquidity and very low interest rates, coupled with a diminishing or very low trade uh, to income relationship. In other words, the, the, the global economy is recovering. Uh, there is still low interest rates and there's a lot of liquidity. And, and you, here you have Latin American countries which uh, have been shocked by uh, diminished trade flows, by terms of trade uh, shocks that still persist. And they have access to a lot of liquidity. So the combination of uh, lower trade uh, flows, like, uh, which is an exogenous shock to us, plus a lot of liquidity still in the market is a combination that may lead to uh, falling into temptations uh, if, the, if the northern country uh, adopts policies uh, that are viewed domestically as uh, having had, uh, requiring a, a, some sort of compensation. So there is money and there is an external shock that ju will justify this. The point is you, you may go very quickly into an unsustainable uh, uh, fiscal path if you, if you do this. So the, the conditions on the liquidity side are there and on the real side are there to make big mistakes. So your recommendation to avoid that would be? Well, basically, uh, you know, we are in a cycle right now. Probably interest rates will go up. And you have to take a long-term view. You have to, you, you, you have to uh, bring into the net present value the flows that you are arguably going to get. Uh, we, we will probably see higher interest rates uh, later on. And as the stocks uh, of debt have not diminished but have grown in this, in this cycle, uh, we are not in a position to adopt debt-intensive uh, compensation uh, policies uh, in any way in, in the region, even though the market may be signaling that this is a moment to go into debt. <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. to, maybe to add that we have always had a lot of interest in favor of protectionist policies in Latin America, very powerful interest. And we have been able to do some trade opening against them. Now these groups feel empowered by the discourse in the, in the US and in Europe. And that's one of our concerns, that this, <coughs> this private interest that were always there for having high protection in our markets are, go, are raising their voices. And so we are like suggesting to the authorities that be very careful with that, that you have to restrain this because you, you, you may get in the worst of world. Perhaps to, to add some political possibility to hold the, the, the pressures is that internally, especially the big countries don't have fiscal space. Um, they're again all battling still high debt burdens and fiscal adjustments. And in a way that does put a, a restriction to, to the number of things they can do because if not very quickly, they're gonna get into very complicated situations. So I'm, I'm thinking of Brazil, but I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking of Mexico. And they just, oh, don't, yeah. and they just don't have the space. That doesn't, has not prevented them in the past for, right. from doing bad things, um, but very quickly they would see the negative outcome. So that perhaps might be a restriction. The other is that their internal markets are not growing. So if, if you try to protect right now when you don't have internal, um, if you want a, I mean, at least a basic stable internal market, you're not gonna get any benefit. So perhaps those two may limit a little bit Again, there's a concern that we have done it in the past, even under those conditions. But the other one is many have tried those things recently and didn't work. And so I think at least for a while, they have the space to tell the same interest groups, like, look, I just gave you the little cookie and it didn't work. So hold on a little bit. But again, the, the temptation is there. Yeah. Okay, just before we open up the questions from the audience, uh, Augusto, what's your first piece of advice going to be to President-elect Lenin Moreno? <laughs> given what you've heard. Well, uh, you know, Ecuador is one case where complications are of a, of a magnitude that are of, in, a, in, in a degree of complication much greater than in the neighboring countries. So the things that Laura and Guillermo were talking about, the uh, uh, restrictions and the possibility of making mistakes in Ecuador, you have to kind of square that. Possibilities of making mistakes are bigger simply because the disequilibrium with which uh, Ecuador is finding itself is much bigger. Ecuador has a very complicated fiscal situation <coughs> where the government size has grown beyond what is reasonable. 
bringing down the size of the government to something that is financeable over the long time is not going to be easy. It's going to create a lot of tension. And Ecuador also has not been able to, to produce an external adjustment as healthy as, say, Colombia, because it's a dollarized country. So it has not been able to adjust the real exchange rate in a similar situation to Bolivia. Ecuador and Bolivia are two countries that now find themselves with an overvalued exchange rate, which is undercutting growth in the case of Ecuador very significantly, and it's creating a large external deficit in the case of Bolivia. So the, the adjustments there are a higher complication, and that, of course, becomes even more complicated because the country seems to be divided down the middle. The recent elections essentially are uh, a tie. Yeah. And so whoever governs is going to govern in a very difficult environment. After 12 years or 15 years where people have experienced a great deal of social progress, and therefore their expectations are up the roof. So I think this is a, this is a, this is a, it's a tough environment, and we have to watch that carefully because uh, my sense is that the region, for the first time in 50 years, was starting to look to an outward-oriented growth model, which is still a fairly close region, but it was starting to look at that. So Latin Americans want to trade in a world that wants to trade less. So we, we really have a, an uphill battle that's not trivial. So what the committee is suggesting and recommending is not without trepidation. This is not going to be easy to do the things that we're saying, avoid the mistakes and seize the opportunities in the type of con context where the space to maneuver has shrunk a lot. OK, let me get some comments and questions from members of the audience. Oh, there's a lot of you. OK, great. Uh, Nora Lustig, let's give you the first one. And then what I, when the microphones come around, <coughs> if I call on you, I'm going to ask you to stand up, say your name, your affiliation, and then uh, keep it short, keep it concise so we can get through more questions. Uh, Nora, we'll go to you first, and then lady in the front here, and then gentleman in the jacket. Take three questions. There's a microphone coming to you. Three questions. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on your question about uh, not uh, carrying out self-inflicting wounds, it is impossible if you have a threat of uh, a tariff on your products not to at least use some retaliation as a counter threat because that's the way you do negotiations. So. It's impossible what you're recommending. It's not going to happen. So what do you recommend in lieu? I mean, what would be a strategy of negotiations that would not end up causing self-inflicting wounds? Because you need that. That's, you know, it follows up on your question. But you need to have some arguments on your end to be able to be credible in terms of if you do that, you're going to get hurt as well. <coughs> So you have to think about what would be the counter. I mean, among the group that you have sitting there, many of them have been politicians, not just economists. So I'm sure they can they can give us some ideas about okay, that. Okay, great, Nora. Thank you. That's like the the, the million dollar question, really, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, okay. Lady in the front, and then yeah. retaliation is not good. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Amparo Bayevia. I'm a lead economist at the World Bank, and uh, I find myself in the very uncomfortable position of having to summon to disagree on one aspect with all the members of the panel. Uh, and, and that is that there is not a natural leader for open trade in the region. Uh, I think that the political uh, unpalatability of open trade in the Latin America region was associated with the United States. I think that open trade with each other and open trade between Latin America and Europe is not politically unpalatable, unpalatable in Latin America. And I can see very well situations where even people like Contemo Cardenas in Mexico, if the United States closes its borders, they would say, we need to find yeah. other markets That's for exactly. Mexican exports because we have already invested. There's a lot of people that are going to be losing jobs and, and so forth. So I don't think that's going to be politically very difficult. On the contrary, I think it may be a political plus. Uh, that, that's more of a comment, really, I think, isn't it? Let's get a statement, uh, a question from the gentleman here, then we'll get some responses from the panel, then we'll come around for some more questions. Uh, I'm Sebastian Strauss. I work at Brookings with uh, Ernesto Talvi, another member of the, of the committee uh, who couldn't be here today. Uh, you've all touched upon, uh, briefly upon, uh, the, uh, the BAT and its possible trade effects, and that all assumes that uh, uh, currency adjustment will not happen, as the proponents of the BAT uh, 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 suggest will. And I fully agree with that, uh, with that assessment. I mean, especially considering that 
uh, most currency movements today are determined by uh, investment flows and not trade flows. But there is, a, uh, there, there is a, a possibility that some degree of adjustment will happen and that the U.S. dollar will depreciate maybe not by 25 percent, but uh, appreciate, sorry, not by 25 percent, but maybe 15 percent, 10 percent. And that could still be uh, a fairly large currency movement, especially if it's sudden. My question is, are any of you concerned at all about uh, the possibility of a financial crisis in the region, uh, especially in countries with uh, large currency mismatches and uh, a balance sheet uh, vulnerabilities? Okay, thanks. Let's get some responses. Let's go work our way backwards, actually. Why don't we get some responses to that last question first about concerns about financial crisis? Liliana, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Yeah, uh, very well put. Uh, yes, we don't expect an offset, but most likely some adjustment, and it will be in the direction of U.S. Uh, dollar appreciation, if that's the, the net effect, right? And yes, in previous statements, we have actually raised as one of the risks a uh, complicated environment for Latin American appreciation, a further appreciation of the dollar. And that is precisely related to the large and increasing amount of corporate debt. Uh, and I will comment uh, at the last section about what you could do to kind of tamper the capital inflows that are coming because we believe that are temporary are actually increasing that problem, right? Because more corporations uh, will be, are the rate, debt of ratio for corporations are increasing. A dollar appreciation, the only thing that does is actually further exacerbate the problem. We didn't want to go deeper into that but that's a, a concern of the committee that has been put forward in a number of statements over and over again, and I thank you, you for raising it back. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Yeah, yeah no, I wanted to uh, expand a little bit on that uh, concept of liability dollarization, uh, which certainly has increased substantially, so I agree fully with what uh, Liliana said. Now, in my own, my own uh, empirical work, we distinguish between uh, liability dollarization vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, where uh, international institutions or banks are involved, and liability uh, uh, dollarization vis-a-vis uh, -vis domestic banks, which in our work we call it domestic liability dollarization. And uh, I feel much more concerned about the second than the first. Because the second one, if you have a problem there, you can paralyze the payment system at home. The other one, you enter into debt negotiations and you have more time to deal with that. The other one just kills you immediately. So uh, my uh, reading of the region is that nothing much has happened in that front uh, recently. And if anything, some countries made a big effort to de-dollarize the banking sector. So from that perspective, the situation may be stronger. Let's get some of the panel's comments on some of the other questions as well, and, and statements. Um, Nora's question, what's your strategy for avoiding uh, self-inflicted wounds? Gilbert Perry from Agus Bank. Nora, I think, and, and I am also going to refer to the question. I, I frankly think that there is an opportunity for doing something that we should have done anyhow, which is more trade and economic links with Europe and Asia, in addition to regional, open regionalism. And the reason for this is not only that, as you say, this, this can be easily explained. I mean, if we have a protectionist threat from the US, we have to find new markets and new partners. And that can help counteract a little bit the protectionist pressure inside. But it's also because the Europeans and the Asians are thinking the same way. When you look at what they are saying, they're saying, oops, if the US goes that way, we have to strengthen the links with Latin America and Asia is the discourse of all the European leaders. The Chinese and the uh, ones now to be in TPP, now that the U.S. dropped the ball, of course, that also creates some risk that you do a bad negotiation. I mean, yeah. you, we have to be careful that we do it in the right way. But I personally see uh, the possibility of moving ahead somehow 
more. For example, Mercosur and the European Union have been negotiating forever, for decades. It may be an opportunity now that this thing really moves. Yeah, and I want to add something before going to Augusto, because it's related to what just Guillermo said. One danger that we have always discussed, in, if you rush too much into getting into these kind of negotiations, is because in the past, or up till recently, being the United States, the leader of globalization meant a lot for Latin America. This is something that needs to be clear, okay? Having less, lost that leader and say China emerging as a new leader of globalization where we have many questions about mar the way markets operate, about governability, about democracy, about all the issues that we're trying, that Latin America is trying to get into can create a huge problem. So we are not suggesting rush into, which is a very important uh, uh, comment to, to add, sorry. Well, I, I'm, I think that uh, Nora is right that we have to take seriously what happens in the psychology of people when you get hit by somebody, big, big, big giant from the north. People want to hit back. Now, uh, I, I, I have two, two comments on that. One is that, uh, well, if you are a little, little guy and somebody hits you back, you have no way of retaliation. You, you may die in the process. So there's a distinction between countries that simply could not retaliate against the US. Think of, for instance, of Peru or Ecuador. Putting tariffs on US imports would be uh, suicidal. So the retaliation for small countries has to be through collective action, the use of multilateral architecture, the WTO, Perhaps the, perhaps the OAS. So they have, we have to play as a group for the small countries. Now, Mexico may have other options. Mexico, the, the, the wisdom for Mexico would be to put on the card response measures that, that do not hurt the Mexican economy. And, and Mexico has plenty of things to put on the table. Coordination of security, drug trade, a lot of other things that would hurt the US but that may give some Mexico some leverage without uh, shooting itself on its foot. Okay. Let, me, let me add to that. Um, one, one thing we did discuss is I, I do think we, we need to find those lawyers that have successfully won cases in the WTO, and the region has those. Like Costa Rica has <coughs> fought in the WTO successfully. And it is true that that does require the other party to accept the ruling. And in this, in this case, it would require the US to accept the ruling. But, but I think there's heterogeneity within the US. Even though the president may have certain views, it is unclear to me that the whole country wants to leave all these international institutions and all, 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 all these implications. So you have there an ally, people that do want to respect the rule of law. Um, and again, small countries like Costa Rica and, and most of the countries in the region, that, that is an option that they need to play. They need to play the courts. Mexico. and. I think there is this fact that people just don't know. Mexico is the number two market of the US. Number one is Canada, number two is Mexico. That leaves them, they gives them leverage and they need to play that. In fact, and, and we have said this, a tariff against Mexico is a tariff against US companies. Um, because a lot of the trade is not only global value chains, it's intra-firm trade, it's US multinational. I think the Mexicans know that. <laughs> much more than the rhetoric in the, in the North. I think that has <laughs> tempered some of the actions. And I think they're now also trying to find alternatives. There is this story, I, don't, I read in the newspaper, that they're talking to Argentina and Brazil to get the corn. Why? Because the corn comes from the US. That will hit a very particular group in the US strongly. Of course, bringing the corn from South America is going to be very expensive. Like, it's not costless. But that is one strategy of trying to think alternatives that will highlight the fact that Mexico is the number two trade market for the US. Just, just one comment regarding Let's get that. you a microphone. Uh, no, it's, it's a minor, but... Uh, for people who no, are watching on the live stream won't okay, be able to hear so, you. Uh, just one small example. Immediately after uh, the US put the import restriction to the city from Argentina, we sold the lemons elsewhere, to Europe. So there was no cost to Argentina. But anyway, we are going to put the lawyers in the WTO, mm -hmm. okay? Because we are going to be demanding later to the US 
but there was no cost for that because it, we were that, that was an international commodity. We sold that somewhere else. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, let's get some more questions. Let's get the gentleman over here, and then that lady over there. I'll take. We may have maybe just back and forth. Peter Hakem, the Inter-American Dialogue. <coughs> uh, you may have answered this question in subtle ways, but it seems to me there are at least two options that Latin American nations, and remember decisions are not made by Latin America, they're made by the, each nation. One is, as you say, to sort of go out and find other markets, sell more in Latin America, sort of find ways to bring the Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance closer together. All of this seems a little bit uh, wishful thinking, frankly, at this point. Over so many years, and they're doing so well and, and couldn't come together. The question is, isn't the alternative is to find accommodation with the US during this period? In other words, don't look for retribution. Don't look for resistance. Don't look for leverage. Look to find ways. And it sounds to me like the Mexicans are precisely sort of trying to find this kind of accommodation. Yes, we may lose a bit here. The US may gain a bit. We may have to lose the sort of the, 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 the trade surplus. But why not accommodate now? and begin to think of the longer term of some kind of integration with the United States, which didn't work in the 90s and may not ever work again. But you know, given the size of the market, the size of the penetration already, why sort of avoid that alternative? OK, thank you. Uh, lady there, this may be the last question. Sure, thanks. I'll make it quick. Uh, my name's Isabel Hoagland from Inside US Trade, and I'd like to hear more about um, this corn deal that, that you mentioned. Um, you know, the Mexican government is exploring bringing its corn elsewhere, uh, specifically from Argentina and Brazil, uh, as well as uh, increasing its domestic production. How would this impact trade uh, with the US and Latin America in general? I'd just like to hear a little bit more elaboration on that. And then a second quick question is, uh, what are the next steps for the US-Guatemala uh, labor dispute under CAFTA? Um, that's kind of been a mysterious uh, ongoing thing, <laughs> so. I don't know that we've really addressed no, that we'll issue, actually. That so question. let's uh, um, maybe stick to your first question. That's right. Are you, is, uh, are you a reporter? Yes, yes, I do. Yes. Yeah, yeah, OK. Um, so panelists, let's get a couple of comments. Uh, the question from the lady was, uh, actually, I didn't even write it down. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I read this in the Financial Times. Um, and I actually read it somewhere else, and I, that is a strategy. If this is a tactic or, or deeper, I, I wouldn't be able to comment because, I, as I said in my comment, I, I, read, <laughs> I read it in the Financial Times. But, but I think what is interesting of the story is that it, it highlights what I said, that the number two exporting market of the, U, of the US is Mexico. So it's not costless to engage in this trade, trade, trade war with uh, Mexico, um, is it why this story is interesting? Because the Mexican corn producers have to always complain that the market went to the U.S. and and again, finding a way um, to bring it from South America is not without a cost. It will be more expensive. There's no doubt about that. But that is an option, much more than I think to retaliate, just to make it evident of the links go both ways, which I think is what needs to be reminded uh, right now. I, I was not sure what you mean by your comment. Um, I think the, about making an accommodation with the US. Yeah, I think more than making the accommodation, I think the Mexicans have just like taken a deep breath <laughs> and <laughs> see what all the tweeting has been about <laughs> and what it will be actual in terms of policy. I think also the markets have realized that there was more sound than bite. Having said that, I think it would be very complicated to come up with some conciliation because uh, no one knows what he wants and what he will do, and there is a lot of uncertainty, and, and it changes. Um, yeah. Okay, Guillermo, this may be the last comment, so let's just see as we're bumping up against the Yeah, end. no, no, very closely. I sympathize with uh, Peter's uh, point of view. I was trying to think who will do that, who is Latin America. 
And that's, a, that, that's problem number one. Uh, how to coordinate that. We, we need a leader too. And uh, in terms of uh, Mexico's uh, retaliation, uh, I also sympathize with Peter in the sense that there's so much noise going on that uh, adding to that by threatening to do something which is bad for the U.S., uh, that will transpire. Uh, the, the administration here will, will become uh, c conscious of that problem without you having to holler it all over the world. Okay. Uh, I think we probably could carry on for a lot longer this afternoon, but we are out of time. I have a feeling these issues are going to be discussed for a lot, lot more time to come. So for now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you please to thank the committee. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>